He's hairy and scary. Mongolians call him Almas. Russians, Almas Day. Others know him as the Wild Man. He's not as famous as Bigfoot or the Yeti, but he may be something they're not. A living, breathing Neanderthal. Is it possible that Paleolithic people still walk this planet? Some Almas seekers are trekking to the ends of the earth in search of an Almas hide or a hair. Have you got an Almas skin here? Many eyewitnesses are convinced the Almas lives. He lowered like this, very fast, and disappeared. I can't say that I felt any animosity from him. If it's not found soon, it could die out. Yet, top anthropologists are skeptical of its existence. I don't think people are going to find a walking, living, breathing Neanderthal. If Neanderthals were still alive, we would find skeletal evidence of it. Um, a lot. Only DNA analysis can reveal whether some evidence is real or rubbish. Examine the evidence with Neanderthal experts and true believers as we go in search of a relic from the past, the last living Neanderthal. The mountains of Western Mongolia and Russia's Caucasus may be home to a relic unlike any other. A living creature that's weathered the test of time and still walks upon terra firma. Locals call him Amaste in Russia's Caucasus and Almas in Mongolia. He's also nicknamed the Man of the Forest or Wild Man. If he's related to Bigfoot, they're distant cousins. Bigfoot's rumored to haunt the backwoods of North America, yet the Almas is said to call Asia home. And geography isn't all that separates the two. Believers in Bigfoot say he may be related to an ancient primate species called Gigantopithecus, which lived until about 300,000 years ago. Asia's Almas is said to be a bit different. Those who've ID'd him say he's less ape and more man. Stone Age man, that is. In fact, many theorize that Asia's Almas might just be a relic Neanderthal. A relic Neanderthal is thought to be a member of a small Neanderthal population that survived for generations. And believers in the Almas claim to have the evidence that may prove this relic creature still lives. Bones, hair samples, and footprints. Science books say Neanderthals officially kicked the bucket around 30,000 years ago. But what if this wasn't true? What if Neanderthals or others like them, such as the Almas, never went extinct? Is it possible that a few stragglers survived and are still eking out an existence in Mongolia and Russia? British creature seeker Adam Davis is hoping to find an Almas in the flesh. Davis, a court investigator by day, spends most of his off hours traveling the world in search of unknown cryptid creatures. People may say cryptozoological work is a bit weird. My motivation is to bring back scientific facts because I believe that a number of these creatures are under serious threat and I'd like to prove their existence. He's launched previous expeditions to find Scotland's Loch Ness Monster, Sumatra's Orang Pendic, the Congo's Dragon, and Mongolia's Death Worm. So far, he's 0 for 4, but has come back to Mongolia to take a stab at finding the wild man. I believe the Oms is a real creature, but it's in serious decline. I think there's very few of them in the very high mountain ranges around western Mongolia. In the last two days, Davis has flown over 4,000 miles from Manchester to the tiny outpost of Hoved, Mongolia. He's on a mission to find the Almas before time runs out. 
Adam's guide and friend, Bill Gay, will help him on his search. A grand adventure lies ahead. Adam and Bill Gay set off into the steps to begin their quest, determined to succeed. Look, a lot of people will watch something like this and think, why is he bothering, yeah? Why, why doesn't he go back to his day job? But I firmly believe that in some very remote places in the world, there are a number of unique creatures who are in, in serious environmental danger. Out on the plains, a group of nomadic horsemen bump into a Brit on the prowl for a primitive man. My name's Adam Davis and I'm from England and I'm really pleased to meet you guys, those beautiful horses. I've got some pictures here, yeah? I want to, I want to show the, the pictures. Have you seen this creature? Has he ever seen this creature? Have you ever seen the creature? <laughs> Yeah. No. What about you guys? Have you heard any stories about the Amish? This kind of thing has been talked about in the past. Do you think it's a real creature? I think it probably used to exist, but I'm not sure it does now. Now, if you were me, and you were tracking this creature, where would you go? The men give him some almost hunting advice. You should go to the mountains. So it lives in the mountains over there? Steered toward the hills, Adam hopes to make the find of the century. Okay, guys, thank you very much. Adam may be off on a wild goose chase, you, but the you. fact is, these wild men rumors have more than one eyewitness to back them up. Today, journalist Nina Grignova finds peace in the forest, but 20 years ago, on an enchanted evening, Nina met a mysterious stranger. In 1980, an 18-year-old Nina and a group of friends traveled to Russia's Pamir Mountains in search of a living wild man. We traveled to the area where it was thought this creature was living, the snowman, or a relic hominoid. But amongst ourselves, we called him Gosha. One night, feeling brave, Nina went into the forest in search of the creature all by herself. All of a sudden, to the left of me, I heard someone banging two stones together. It was believed that it was the way Gosha played around. I turned around. He was standing and staring at me. The face had typical Neanderthal features, like a prehistoric man. He wasn't the teen heartthrob, but Nina was awestruck. I can't say that I felt any animosity from him, but all my feelings just atrophied. Next, Nina thought she'd draw him in closer, using what she believed would be the ultimate Alma's attractor. We were looking into each other's eyes, and then, for some reason, I took this squeaky toy out of my pocket. I heard of hunters trying to attract ducks, so I thought these sounds might be familiar to him, and they would attract him. Sadly, her instincts were off. I instinctively squeezed it, and that's when he turned around and headed down the hill. Nina was left behind, with nothing but a squeaky toy, and her heart overflowing with emotion. So many years passed, but I still have these very strong feelings. I get so nostalgic. I dream about the Pamir Mountains. I dream about Gosha. So much for the close encounter. As every investigator knows, eyewitness testimony can be unreliable. What we need is physical evidence and there's one place we may be able to find it. Moscow, Russia. Igor Bortsev is convinced that wild men still roam the planet. He's spent over 30 years of his life trying to find Asia's Almas. I'm convinced that hairy primates uh, exist and I want to prove that they exist. Igor calls himself a hominologist, meaning he studies hairy bipedal primates that are human-like, 
but not human. It started out as a hobby, but now it's his profession. Each day, he heads to work at one of Moscow's little-known secrets, Igor's very own Institute of Hominology. Here, Igor and an office staff of three put out books, a newsletter, and a website. Igor's expeditions to find the Almas all start here. It is possible that Almas is a relic Neanderthals. Igor's office is packed with souvenirs from past expeditions and footprints and hair samples. We have found them in Pamiralai mountain during the expeditions. We have found one um, nest uh, of them, of hominoids. There are three samples here. It would be nice to study them, to we'll make a DNA analysis of these samples. Igor has quite a collection. I have found a very nice sample of excrement. But scat aside, Igor's been holding on to vital evidence that might solve one of the greatest Alma's mysteries of all. Could Neanderthals still be walking this planet and even interbreeding with us? Strange tales about hairy creatures run rampant across Europe and Asia. In Europe, images of wild men called woodwoses appear on medieval crests and manuscripts. Further into Asia, legends about other hairy creatures emerge. In Nepal, locals speak of a beast called the Yeti. This mysterious snowman caught the attention of Sir Edmund Hillary, one of history's most famous mountaineers. Hey, Jumbo! Ah! Yeah. Oh, oh, what's that? Yeti. 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 Aha. In 1953, Hillary and Tenzang Norgay were the first to summit Nepal's Mount Everest. And on their way to the top, they spotted large footprints in the snow. Years later, in 1962, Hillary returned to the Himalayas in search of the Yeti. His team found a purported Yeti scalp, but soon learned their find was a fake. The Yeti scalp turned out not to be from a Yeti, but a goat. Another creature called the Yeren is said to stalk China's Hubei province. Chinese scientists have been hot on the Yeren's trail since the 1950s, but have yet to find one in the flesh. Nepal's Yeti and China's Yeren are hardly alone. America's got Bigfoot, Australia's got the Yaoi, and Sumatra's got the Orang Pendek. All are thought to be more ape than man. But the Almas is a wild man with a difference. He's supposed to be a bit more human than ape, and more like our cousin, the Neanderthal, perhaps not extinct after all. So, exactly what do we know about Neanderthals? The first skeleton was unearthed in Germany's Neander Valley in 1856. The skeleton belonged to an extinct species of human, which scientists called Homo neanderthalensis, or Neanderthal. Neanderthals, who lived alongside modern humans for about 20,000 years before vanishing, got a bad rap from the start. In 1908, a French paleontologist named Dr. Marceline Boulle reconstructed what he thought was a typical Neanderthal skeleton. Boulle's completed model influenced the scientific community for decades. New York University's Dr. Todd Disotel, a biological anthropologist, and Dr. Shara Bailey, a physical anthropologist, study the bones and DNA of Neanderthals. Their NYU Human Origins Lab has access to the ultimate Paleolithic prize, Neanderthal DNA. Since 1997, scientists have sequenced DNA from bones found at Neanderthal dig sites around Europe. 
Todd and Shar know Neanderthals inside and out. And one of the things they teach their students is how Boole's model was fundamentally flawed. Boole recreated the Neanderthal as sort of this very hairy, ape-like, uh, dim-witted, stooped over, not even human, just ape-man. And I think that sort of stuck with Neanderthals for quite a while. I don't think he did it intentionally. I think he was a product of, of his times and a, and a product of the fact that the skeleton that he based his reconstruction on was an old man and maybe wasn't representative of all man's calls. Boole had got it all wrong. The skeleton he used wasn't a healthy specimen, but an old Neanderthal man riddled with arthritis. Eventually, the model was declared to be inaccurate, but the damage had been done. Even today, being called a Neanderthal is not a term of endearment. Well, it's certainly not a compliment, right, <laughs> to be called a Neanderthal. You think stupid, you think um, brutish, you think mean, right? So this, this is our image of a Neanderthal. Over the last 150 years, scientists have been able to piece together a better picture of Neanderthals and what they really may have been like. Neanderthals were stocky, strong, and well adapted to cold weather. Neanderthals were a very interesting group of uh, humans that lived in Europe uh, all the way to sort of almost to Central Asia during the height of the Ice Ages. Uh, they lived in Europe from approximately 200,000 years ago to about 30,000 years ago. But could some Neanderthals have been smart enough to get by and survive to the present age? In Mongolia, stories about the Almas echo from the past and ripple into the present. But finding evidence is another matter. For centuries, the history of Mongolia's traditions and folklore were preserved in the records of Buddhist monasteries. It is here that we get a glimpse of a world where the Almas was fact and not fiction. In 1937, a Mongolian scientist reported that Buddhist monks were using an Alma skin in sacred rituals. And an ancient Buddhist medical text recommends consuming Alma's meat to cure mental disease and jaundice. There's just one problem. Much of this history was destroyed forever. Communism swept across Mongolia in 1921 and cut it off from the world. Stalin's brutal purges further tormented the country and hit the monasteries especially hard. Thousands of temples were burned to the ground. And over 10,000 monks were executed. But Buddhism survived among this resilient people, even if many of the monasteries did not. Today, throughout Mongolia, the faithful worship regularly, in this case, at a former pool hall. Adam's here in search of an Alma skin and some advice. Have you got an Alma skin here? He said no. He said no. <laughs> he said no. <laughs> um, if you were going to look for the Almas in Mongolia, where would you go? Well, let's see. I think you should go into the remote, untouched places. Do you know any stories about the Alms? My relative saw it and said it was hairy and very big. Obviously there's been a lot of talk about an Alms skin, but I'd love to have that bit I think it was unrealistic to expect to just walk in here and find it hanging on the wall, you know. But you've got to ask, because if you don't ask, you don't get. Adam may not have located an Alma's skin, but has found the next best thing, a local eyewitness. Adam and Bill Gay seek out the monk's relative, an elder named Ulzi. A well-respected hunter and herder, Ulzi swears he's crossed paths with an Almas. Woolsey takes Adam and Bill Gay back to the scene of his sighting. The story goes, 
Woolsey was driving through the remote area when suddenly he spotted a strange, hairy creature on the side of the road. Startled, it ran in front of the car and disappeared into the rocks, leaving only footprints behind. At the scene, Adam is struck by what looks to be the perfect Almas habitat. Amazing. That is a really good cave, actually. Yeah. This environment has shelter in the caves, water and food in the marmot and the small animals that live around here. So it's perfect Almas territory, and if they do exist, this is exactly where they'd live. Ulzi takes the boys to the exact spot where he claims he saw the Almas. Was it standing like an animal or standing like a man? He was standing just like a person, just like a human in standing position. While he was standing like two to three seconds, he lowered like this, very fast, and disappeared. Adam starts to cross-examine Ulzi. Did it run like this, yeah? Okay. A little bit lower, yeah? So, like this, yeah? Watch this. So, it, it ran more like an animal, yeah? Did the Almas leave any evidence behind him? Yes, footprints. Get those long toes in. Adam asks Ulzi to put pen to paper and draw what he saw. Ulzi sketches out the footprint. Next, he creates a picture of the Almas. Without a doubt, it looked like a human with hair and standing on two legs. But something is not quite right. Ulzi's Almas seems to be wearing a dress. And its footprint only has four toes which would make it quite an oddity in the primate world. He's not going to be Leonardo da Vinci, is he? These questionable drawings bring out the interrogator in Adam. Yeah, but you told me earlier it had dark hair. You were some distance away. Plenty of the ibex and goats have dark hair, don't they? Why couldn't it be one of those? I am a hunter. I have experience. I can differentiate between animals and humans. Are you telling me the truth, yes or no? Yes, it is a fact. It is real. Thank you. The interrogation was a success and calls for some powdered tobacco called snuff. Here's a bit of snuff. By way of compensation. <laughs> Sniffing snuff is a Mongolian tradition. I think the interview that Ulzi did with me was really believable. Um, I do this for a living cross-examination and I'm looking during my job to see traits that people lie with. Normally when people lie, they raise their pitch and tone, they wave their arms around, and he did none of that. The single thing in that interview is that he's been a hunter all his life, and he was quite clear that the creature stood with an upright back like a man. Could it be Neanderthal man? Well, let's see if we can get some more evidence and try and find out. Adam and his team are back on the trail of the elusive Mongolian Almas. Meanwhile, back at the Institute of Hominology, Igor has been guarding the best piece of physical evidence that could prove the existence of the Almas. And these aren't your everyday skulls in the closet. This may be Zana. This is Huit, son of Zana. According to Igor, Zana may be a relic Neanderthal, and Quit may be her half-human son. These skulls have one heck of a story. They both may be related to Neanderthals and each other. One of the skulls is rumored to belong to a woman named Zana. The story of Zana is one of the most famous and hotly debated Almas cases on record. According to local legends and cryptozoological reports, Zana may have been an Almas that lived during the mid-19th century. Zana... Igor slips into Russian to tell us Zana's story. The story goes, in southern Russia in 1850, hunters stumbled upon something weird in the forest, a strange, hairy, wild woman. They threw a net over her and dragged her back to the village of Tina, where locals gave her a welcome befitting any wild woman of the day. They tossed her into a cage. 
According to local lore, Zana was less than thrilled with the trappings of village life. The villagers tried to dress her, but Zana was an unwilling model. And they made her cooked meals, but she refused them, preferring raw food instead. Over time, locals tried to teach her simple tasks. But Zana was only able to master basic skills. Eventually, it's rumored that Zana did find some unscrupulous admirers in town and had several children. Quit was one of her sons. Igor is convinced that Zana may be the real deal, a relic Neanderthal. And Quit may be a hybrid, a possible cross between a human and a Neanderthal. This may be uh, Zana's skull, but maybe not. I don't, uh, don't know. It's necessary to analyze. If uh, Zana was a uh, Neanderthal woman, that means Neanderthals live until now. There may be one way to find out. DNA. DNA can tell us if Zana and Quit are Neanderthal mother and hybrid son. Or if both skulls are simply homo sapiens and not relics from the past. New York University's Human Origins Lab will solve the mystery. Dr. Todd Disotel can compare Quit's and Zana's DNA to Neanderthal DNA. And Dr. Shara Bailey can closely examine the two skulls and reveal details DNA cannot. Igor is reluctant to send his fragile skulls on a journey overseas. But he's come up with a plan to get Todd and Shara the information they need. Igor heads to the doctor's office. First up, a CT scan to get Shara 360-degree images of both skulls. Next up, the dentist. DNA is not only found in bones and blood, but in teeth. Extractions generally call for Novocaine, but these patients don't feel a thing. Once complete, Igor packs up the samples and ships them out. Will Todd and Char be able to solve the mystery of the skulls and put Igor's questions about Quit and Zana to bed once and for all? Meanwhile, back in Mongolia, sunrise warms a hidden valley filled with nomadic families. Almas hunter Adam Davis goes house to house, or gare to gare in this case, in search of clues. A foreigner in these remote parts is about as rare as the Almas itself. How would he feel, yeah? If one of these was walking past his gare? <laughs> I would be surprised. <laughs> Adam is offered a bowl of warm milky tea at every house he enters. You know, there's only so many dairy products I can eat. Hi, 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 hi. My name's Adam, and I'm from England. Have some um, English snuff. Try some. Once again, a bit of ceremonial snuff is passed around and seems to get people talking. Why doesn't he believe it's a real animal? Since I haven't seen it, I don't believe in it. Do you think the Almas is a dangerous creature? They're not dangerous. Why? Well, like any animal trying to survive, it's afraid of humans. Finally, Adam knocks on the right door. An elder nomad knows what he's looking for and where to go find it. People say that an almost lives in a cave nearby. Does he know where the cave is? Everybody around here knows the location of a cave. Everyone knows. 
This is the break Adam has been waiting for. Now he can put his plan into action. Oh yeah. yeah. The reputed Almas cave is straight ahead. But is there a living Neanderthal lurking inside? <laughs> Igor's care package filled with teeth, CT scans and hair samples arrives at NYU's lab not a moment too soon. Todd's team quickly sets to work extracting DNA out of the hair and teeth. DNA is actually often very well preserved in teeth. I mean, teeth are the very hardest part of the body, so if you can get inside a tooth, you're very likely to be able to retrieve the DNA that was initially present during the growth of that tooth. Meanwhile, Shara examines Quitz and Zana's CT scans. Is it possible that Zana could have been part of a relic Neanderthal population that survived up until the 1800s? And could Quit really have been a cross between Neanderthal and human being? If either of these skulls reveal Neanderthal DNA, Igor has made a remarkable discovery. The New York University team wants to uncover the truth, but they're skeptical about Quit's and Zana's Neanderthal origins. Most scientists agree that Neanderthals vanished around 30,000 years ago. But exactly how they disappeared is open to debate and very controversial. Many Neanderthal bones are covered with slash marks. Some say these markings are the signs of cannibalism. And some believe that by consuming infected tissue, they may have contracted a deadly disease. There are Neanderthal specimens that look like they were cooked, perhaps eaten. Um, is that why they went extinct? I doubt it. Others say competition over food and territory sparked a war between modern humans and Neanderthals. Still another theory proposes that drastic changes in environment caused Neanderthal populations to crash. I think the best hypothesis we have uh, going for us right now for the extinction of Neanderthals is the marked climatic changes we see around 30,000 years ago combined with competition with incoming modern humans. I think basically the Neanderthals disappeared because the new group of modern people coming in, probably with a slightly more sophisticated culture, outcompeted them. For decades, some scientists speculated that modern humans caused Neanderthals' extinction by breeding with them. In the scientific community, the issue of Neanderthal and human interbreeding is a hot one. Humans are just not that discriminating. <laughs> I don't think that, I mean, if they met, they, you know, certainly would have interbred. But that doesn't mean that they were the same species. Neanderthals and humans overlapped in time for actually many thousands of years in different regions of the Middle East and Europe. Did Neanderthals and modern humans have sex? Almost certainly. I mean, that just seems extremely likely. Did they produce offspring? Maybe, probably not. Did they produce fertile, viable hybrid offspring that then had offspring themselves? I think not. Although the scientists are skeptical, Adam Davis is not. He continues to charge onwards and upwards. Bilge, after we get round this ridge, we're going to have to be really careful because if it smells us, it's going to run away. The rumored Almas Cave lies at the top of this ridge. More like a mountain goat than an almas. What I'm doing now is approaching the cave of the almas. It's really important when you approach um, a lair of an animal that you don't, it doesn't smell you and you don't spook it. So I'll be as quiet as I can. This cave might just be home to Adam's holy grail. 
There are plenty of places in here in Elmas could hide. A whole yeah. family could live here, couldn't they? Yeah. I mean, look down there, you've got that massive hole. Goodness knows where that goes to. Yeah, they could be living up in any of those little caves up there. Yeah. But the thing is, right now, they've definitely heard us approach, so they're not going to come out right now. Okay. What we need to do is draw them out, and the best way to do that is by using the raw meat and the motion cameras. Adam puts his plan in motion. You see that eye-shaped ridge there? I think that that will provide enough elevation that we can, if we, lie, if we go down low for the stakeout, we'll actually be, not be able to be viewed from the cave. Okay. And from there, we'll be able to observe anything coming in and out of the cave. Next, Adam and Bill Gay set up a remote camera trap, hoping to catch an Almas in action. It's set it up over here, yeah? Um, all the people we spoke to said that the Almas was about the height of a man. Yeah. So, this is a motion detector. If you just give me that yeah. thing there, I'll plug which will stop and start the camera. The camera's on and ready to go. But Adam's work isn't finished. He's counting on the fact the Almas isn't a vegetarian. Okay, I'm putting out raw meat rather than carrots because uh, the locals told me that that's what the Almas likes to eat, so Hopefully he'll be hungry, and from my observational post down there, I'll be able to see him and take a photograph, maybe. Fingers crossed. As night falls, part two of Adam's plan is put into effect. It's stakeout time. A few hours have passed, and an Almas has yet to appear, but the night is still young. Like two dedicated detectives, Adam and Bill Gay man their post. But Bill Gay's a bit of a stakeout rookie. How many of us will stay here? Staying here all night. We've got it. Yeah. Do a proper stakeout. Yeah. We've got to sit like this. Be really quiet. Until the sun up. Not move until the sun rises. Spot on. The team hunkers down for a serious night of Almas surveillance. For a bit of whiskey? I know. I know. You never say no. Yeah. I never say no. And snuff. And snuff. As the stakeout drags on, Adam and Bill Gay ponder life's larger questions, such as Mongolians' meat-eating ways. <laughs> Tell me the truth. Tell me the truth. <laughs> what do you think of vegetarians, Bill Gay? It's a grassy If an Almas ran across, yeah. you'd be fine. <laughs> yeah, you'd think, right, my job is done. But if you saw a lettuce blowing across the plane, I think you tremble in fear. <laughs> As dawn draws near, Adam and Bill Gay's enthusiasm winds down. Adam continues to keep watch, but Bill Gay seems to have made other plans with the insides of his eyelids. Will Adam and Bill Gay be able to survive the night and capture a shot of an Almas? Can Todd and Shara uncover the truth behind Zana's and Quit's origins? And will it be good news or bad for Igor? New York City, it's the city of bright lights and big dreams. Igor has traveled all the way to the Big Apple to hear the results from the New York University team face to face and discover if Zana's and Quit's alleged Neanderthal roots are fact or fiction. Could his hopes and dreams be shattered or will he get the surprise of a lifetime? Come on, Bill, okay? Not showing up. In Mongolia, Sunlight rouses Adam and Bill Gay from an uneventful night. Their only hope now lies with the motion camera. I think it's fair to say the stakeout was a bit of a flop. So what we're going to do now um, is go up to the cave and see if we've got anything on the infrared. Not too optimistic though, I didn't see much movement. Adam and Bill Gay eagerly run through the footage, 
but it's not quite what they expected. <laughs> hey, look, Belgi, there is a vegetarian in Mongolia. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that bird hasn't even touched the meat. Yeah. The footage is nowhere near what I call inspiring. Um, it's not disappointing because I have a lovely bird, a lovely rare Mongolian bird, cooking through the cave after a whole night on a stakeout. Ooh, I'm so impressed. And, you know, the thing about it is, is I left out a lovely big chunk of meat for the almas. That was my dinner, that was. Frankly, it's a washout. The cave's a bust, and Adam and Bill Gay move on. But Adam doesn't plan to give up on the almas anytime soon. One cave down, but there are plenty more to go. Back at Todd and Shara's New York University lab, the results are in. Shar has examined the CT scans and come to a few conclusions about Quit and Zana, based on the shape of their skulls. When we take a look at this profile of Quit, it's almost more modern than this modern human here on the right. So there's absolutely no evidence of any kind of similarity between Neanderthals here on the left and Quit. With Zana, the hypothesis is that she's some kind of relic Neanderthal, which means that she should be more like this Neanderthal here on the left than she is like this modern human on the right. But when you look at it, what's really cool about this, when you look at it, she's almost identical to this modern human here. I mean, take a look at the profile here in the back of the skull, especially this area right here where it curves in. There's no evidence from this this profile, this CT scan, that, that Zana is a relic Neanderthal. But although Zana's skull may be human, there is something strange about her jaw. She's an unusual looking gal, this jutting out here that um, looks kind of ape-like. What could have possibly caused Zana to both act and look different from others? Based on the skull alone, Shar is only able to speculate. My working hypothesis is that she probably had some kind of syndrome that left her with rather odd facial features um, and a lowered mental capacity. A sad revelation. Rather than a wild woman from the mountains, she may in fact have been suffering from a condition that led her fellow man to first ostracize, then in prison, and mistreat her. Todd's DNA results will reveal the ultimate truth about Quit and Zana too far and their possible Neanderthal roots we just got the results right off our uh, DNA sequencer so I can show I'm, you I'm what happy. we've found I'm happy that it happened. it's time to break the news to Igor the hair samples were basically completely negative but all three teeth that we worked with yielded good DNA evidence the result shows that the DNA that we got out of Zana and Quit share the same condition that modern humans have um, to me this is a pretty unequivocal result suggesting that Zana and Quit are indeed modern humans um, not Neanderthals, not relic Neanderthals, not even hybrids, but absolutely, completely modern human specimens. Now for the good news. What is interesting, though, is they have the very same DNA type. So Zana could indeed be Quit's mother. Next, it's Shara's turn. I found that Zana's skull was unusual looking. She had, yeah, yeah. like you said, she had a really protruding yeah. or marked pragmatism, protruding lower part of the face. She also had rather large orbits. Um, but overall, I didn't see anything in particular that, that made me think that she, you know, looked Neanderthal-like. We're waiting for 30 years to be analyzed. Now you made this analyze. Thank you very much. <laughs> Case closed. But the day isn't over. Cheers. 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 Todd and Shara are supportive of efforts such as Igor's and Adam's. This is real vodka. That's real vodka. <laughs> Yet, at the end of the day, they are scientists. However, Igor and other believers refuse to give up hope and are convinced the Almas is still out there. Because I know the places where this creature visited, I should go to them with open heart and with a good, uh, fr friendly uh, attitude to them. And they will understand. 
they should understand. We want to meet them, and they want to meet us. This meeting will take place sometime very soon. If you believe in something, it will happen. I think it's very important for the armors to be found because it's in a very remote area of Mongolia. If it's not found soon, it could die out. And if it dies out, we could have lost something that's a very important part of our own heritage. But Todd and Shara aren't going to be easily swayed. If Neanderthals were still alive, we would find skeletal evidence of it. Um, a lot. <laughs> I don't think people are going to find a walking, living, breathing Neanderthal. More likely, we'll find something else of equal importance that would be useful to science.